So they say that confession is good for the soul. And I thought we'd have kind of a mass confession this morning. How many people would admit out loud, I love coffee? Anybody, anybody willing to admit out loud, you love coffee? How many people, it's a little more extreme than you love coffee? Like you really, really love it. Like it's a huge part of your life. Like, hi, I'm Jim. I'm a coffee-holic. It's been approximately a minute and a half since I had my last drink kind of thing. You know what I'm talking about? So how many people, like the, from the moment you wake up, immediately you think about coffee? Anybody? Like that's the first, first step. Just look around, you guys. All right, just look around. At all the, and they tend to be on this side of the room for some reason. You guys feel independent of coffee. I don't know. But I'm not here to judge because I almost love coffee. Actually, I, I, I love everything about coffee except the actual coffee and the taste. And I, as a non-morning person, I love the idea of coffee. And, and, and honestly, if you're a coffee lover and like, please don't give me your tricks for how to make it taste not gross. Like they don't work, all right? I've tried a bajillion times to love coffee. It's not good. Like it's like, oh, you really love the taste of the coffee if you put enough sugar and milk in it to make it not like taste like coffee, right? Like so I, like you like coffee flavored like milk syrup. That's what you like. You don't actually like coffee. And also I have a life rule where I, I don't take advice from addicts. So just save, <laughs> save your advice, okay? Uh, but if you love coffee, right, it changes your life every single day that you have it. Right? Everything about it is amazing, right? The, the sound of the coffee maker as it brews your liquid happiness is just glorious music to your ears, especially when your brain is still waking up, right? And oh, that aroma, right? If heaven has a scent, it's fresh brewed coffee. And then you take that cup, that freshly poured cup in your hands and its warmth just wraps around your body and actually wraps around your soul like a soft, warm blanket. And you watch the steam drift off the top of the cup and it dances its beautiful dance for you, all for your enjoyment. And then when your lips touch the rim of the cup and you take that first sip and the coffee runs over your taste buds and your mouth throws a party. And the caffeine rushes into your bloodstream and in spite of their protest, it pushes your eyes open lovingly and gently welcoming you to a new day. Whew. Right, like seriously. If you don't drink coffee, you're like, man, I might have to try this. This is what's going on. And it's in that moment, right? If you're a coffee drinker, it's in that moment that you know there is a God and he loves you because this little cup exists, right? And part of what makes that experience so powerful is that it's like completely sensory, right? It, it engages all five of your senses, which is something that we understand, but not something that we usually give a lot of thought, right? But, but actually medical science tells us that your body has somewhere between 100 million and 15 billion sensory receptors that enable you to see, and hear, and smell, and taste, and touch. And, and like, if you're like, wow, 100 million versus 15 billion, that is a huge range. The reason for that range is because they don't actually know. Like they, that some of them estimate it, so it just gets to be such a high number, they're like, ah, oh, it's a lot, maybe 15 billion. But whatever the actual number is, what we do know is that you were created to experience life in multiple different ways, on multiple different levels. And so that the more engaged with your senses that you are, the more impactful a moment and an experience actually is. One of the things that I think is true in life is that we don't realize how much we need or even appreciate something until it's gone, until we lose access to it, until we don't have it, right? I mean, it's true in a million different ways, but we, we don't think about how much we rely on our cars until they don't start. And you're just like, oh my gosh, I flipping hate this car. It's supposed to start and it's not starting. Or, or have you ever, more specific to today, have you ever lost one of the use of one of your senses? Maybe it was an injury or an illness or <clears throat> age. You can't smell anything because you're sick. You can't see or hear like you used to. So um, we have a float in the 
uh, Eagle Fun Days parade and we always do the like water part. And so this year in the parade, we were doing the water part and it is like, it's just a battle for survival. It is like the most hardcore water fight you've ever had in your life. And so my wife was walking and she didn't even notice till we were almost done, but somewhere she took a blast of water to the face that knocked her glasses off. And she didn't notice because you can barely see because people are shooting you in the face with water the whole time and you're just trying to survive. And so she, she had no idea afterwards. We went and looked, we couldn't find them. And, uh, and the eye doctor said it was gonna take like a week and a half to get replacements. And so for like a week and a half, two weeks, she went backwards, she found some old ones, but her eyes have gotten way worse since the old ones worked. And so there was a Sunday where she was here supposed to be playing uh, the keyboard and, uh, and she couldn't read the music, even with her old glasses on. But we discovered that if she put like my readers or my old glasses and then her glasses on and then like a third pair on, like it was like this triple focus thing she could actually see. Like it, it, it's, it's a bummer when you get older, right? Like, but you actually appreciate, oh my gosh, like I actually enjoy seeing. And, and when that happens, you swear if you ever get it back, you'll never take it for granted. But then you do get it back and that's exactly what you do. You find your glasses or your sinuses heal, your ears clear. And it doesn't take very long for, before you go right back to not giving any of it a second thought. And you can't help it. Because the thing is, like, our, our bodies aren't just the, the, the cars our souls are driving around in. They're actually essential for us to connect to the world around us and to life. The problem is that most of us are living at a pace where we're just sort of skimming across the surface of our life. Our lives are either so messy that we're not really paying attention and we're just trying to find these moments where we can escape the reality of our lives, or we're so fixated on the future and what the future is going to be and how we're planning it out and what it's going to look like that we're actually absent from this present moment. Either way, we're not engaged in the present. We're not really tapped in. We're not living inside our bodies. We're always in our heads. We're not tapped into our senses. We're not experienced in the moment. Essentially, we live our life missing out on our life. Now, the reason why we're doing this series is because I think it's possible that if that's the way we're living, we're not just missing out on life, we're, we may be missing out on God. So there's a, there's a line in the Old Testament where God says something really interesting. In Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 21, God is speaking to his people and he says, listen, you foolish and senseless people with eyes that do not see and ears that do not hear. And God was going, look, I, he's doing so many amazing and incredible things around them. And he, incre he created them with the capacity to experience those things, to experience him. But because their senses were dulled, their lives were faded and flat, shallow and hollow. They weren't living the beautiful, vibrant life that was layered and with intricate textures and shapes, but a flattened sort of imitation, washed out gray life. They weren't living a deeply rooted and connected life that was full and overflowing, but a shallow, shriveled, hollow simulation. Could there be any better description of the way that life feels so often for us in our modern world than just sort of hollow? So I, I've always loved uh, the Goo Goo Dolls. They've made a lot of great music. Uh, but in 1998, they released maybe their most famous song, not maybe, by a long shot, their most famous song. It's been streamed like two billion times on Spotify. It was a part of the, like, um, the soundtrack to a movie called The City of Angels. The song is called Iris. And there's a line in the song that I think kind of captures this a little bit. It says, you can't fight the tears that ain't coming or the moment of truth in your lies when everything feels like the movies. You bleed just to know you're alive. Hollow shallow, faded, flat. One of Jesus' catchphrases in the New Testament was, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. In other words, he was going, just because you have your senses doesn't mean that you know how to use them, but also you can work at it and learn how to use them. And so that is what this month, that is what this series is, is all about. Because as it turns out, Faith is not just spiritual or intellectual or emotional. It is all of those things for sure, but it's also physical. It encompasses all of us. It's absolutely more than your five senses, but it's definitely not less than them. So let me show you what I mean. So in the scriptures, God led his people with a pillar of fire. Why couldn't he just say, hey, follow me? 
I'll show you where I'm gonna go. I'll speak to you in your hearts. No, he made a pillar of fire. When the temple was being built in the Old Testament, it was breathtaking and extravagant, but every single detail, every single little piece of it was laid out by God. All the instructions, all the details. He gave them specific instructions for the oils and the incense and the perfumes and the sacrifices that were used in the temple. The kind of aromas that they would give off. The Bible is full of eating and drinking and festivals and parties. And maybe the biggest deal of all when it comes to our senses is that when God began to unfold his plan to rescue humanity, he insisted on doing it by coming himself in a physical body, allowing you and I to see him and hear him and to touch him. See, the truth is God can do anything he wants in any way he wants, but over and over and over again, at least in the scriptures, he chooses to connect with us and to connect us with each other in ways that are tangible, in ways that engage our senses, our physical bodies, which makes sense because after all, he created us and he gave them to us. I mean, think about for a second your ability to see, which is what we're gonna spend the rest of our time talking about is your sight, my sight, our ability to see. The retina in your eye has 120 million rods and seven million cones that enable you to perceive 10 million different and distinct colors. The human eye can perceive 10 million different colors. God didn't have to make us that way, but he did. Our visual system is the most highly developed system in our bodies, Hands down, it's the primary driver for how we experience and interact with the world. I mean, if you hear something even slightly interesting, beautiful, funny, or threatening, you will almost always turn around and look at it. Or have you ever tried to describe what something looks like to somebody when they've never seen it? Or how about when you're in the A group on a Southwest flight (laughs) and you get on board and you got your nice comfy aisle seat on the plane And then when all those suckers in the back in the C group get on the plane, all that's left is middle seats, right? What do you do? I can tell you what you don't do. You do not make eye contact with any of those people. Why? Because that visual connection might be a signal to them that you're just the friendly face they've been looking for. And you've been saving that middle seat just for them. And you don't want them to sit down next to you. So you look away. But maybe the significance of our ability to see is captured in four simple words that we've all said, or at least all thought, maybe we've even said it or thought it recently, is that I can't unsee that. Dude, why'd you show that to me? I can't can't unsee that. We've all had things that we wish we could unsee, but we can't. Our, Our ability is to see is so powerful that we can't unsee things we actually haven't even seen. Because we can get a visual in our head of something that you've never actually seen with your eyes and you can be stuck with that visual, unable to unsee it. Because when we look at something, we always see more than what our eyes show us. Which is why we've all been in situations where people are looking at the same thing, but they all saw something very different. Because we all don't see in the same way. In fact, it's kind of weird to think about, but your brain shows you what it decides that you need to see. It chooses what information it thinks will be useful to you, and that's where it aims your attention. Not only that, not only does it decide what what you need to see and what you're going to see, it chooses how you're going to see it. So um, if you were on the internet or alive back in 2015 or any time since then, you've probably seen a picture of this dress. That dress right there. Was it blue and black or was it white and gold? So objectively, in real life, it's a blue and black dress, but for millions of people, their brain showed it to them as white and gold. And not because they're crazy, and not because their eyes don't work, but because when we have inadequate information, such as a low quality photo with bad lighting and bad color, your brain fills in the gaps and it just sort of makes a guess. What's interesting to know is that that I know people who initially saw it as white and gold, but then at some point, They looked at it again and they saw it was black and blue. And once they saw that it was black and blue, they could never ever see it the other way again. They couldn't unsee it. Now, I bring all that up because that doesn't just happen to us at a surface level, at a physical level. Because the truth is, in any environment, 
When we look, we don't just observe, we perceive and we interpret. We connect dots and we draw conclusions and we create narratives and we make predictions and we imagine possibilities, which may be why God talks so much about vision and seeing and sight and blindness in the scriptures. It's everywhere. And when you open the scriptures, you begin to read them. There's, there's always an enormous amount of wordplay that's going on whenever you read a verse. Rarely does a word or concept mean just one thing. For example, what does it mean in John chapter nine when it says that someone was blind from birth? What does it mean in Acts chapter nine when Paul is blinded by a light from heaven and then a few verses later, scales fall from his eyes and he can see clearly? What does Jesus mean in Matthew 15 when he says that the blind are leading the blind? What does it mean in Luke 24 when people who can clearly see and aren't blind at all have their eyes opened? So there's this crazy story in the Old Testament that I think kind of illustrates my point. In this time in history, Israel was at war with a people called the Aramaeans. They were outmanned and they were outgunned. But every time the Aramaeans went to attack them, the Israelites would somehow get the drop on them. They would beat them to the punch. They would get there first and they would be waiting for them and ambush them when they arrived. And so the king of Aram was going crazy. He was gonna lose his mind because he couldn't figure out what was happening or how they were doing it. And so that's where we're gonna pick up the story. It's found in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 11. It says, the king of Aram became very upset over this and he called his officers together and he demanded, which of you is a traitor? Who's been informing the king of Israel of my plans? Verse 12, it's not us, my lord, the king. One of the officers replied, Elisha, the prophet in Israel, tells the king of Israel, even the words that you speak in the privacy of your bedroom. Go and find out where he is, the king commanded, so I can send troops to seize him. Which, if he believed what he just heard is an odd instruction, right? that somehow they know everything you're saying. So why not write it down? But he says, go find them so I can send troops to seize them. And then the report came back, Elisha is at Dothan. So one night the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. So let's, let's pause there for just a minute. So, so Israel is overmatched, but God keeps downloading the uh, Aramean military strategies and the attack plans to this guy, Elisha, who was the prophet in Israel. And then Elisha goes to the king of Israel and tells him the plans. Now, can you imagine just for a moment, can you imagine knowing every move your opponent was gonna make before they made it, right? Can, can you imagine how that would look, what that would feel like, what advantage that would give you? And that's where I wanna begin with this story. That's what one of the first places, one of the first things I want you to see. See, it doesn't matter what you're up against today. It doesn't matter the odds of your situation. You don't have to be afraid because when you're overwhelmed, there's more going on than you know. And the God who's on your side, he specializes in the impossible. What was happening, the reason why the king of Aram was going crazy was because it just didn't make sense. It didn't seem possible. And yet it was still happening. The God who's on your side, he specializes in it. It doesn't mean that everything always turns out like you want it to. We all know that. But it does mean that there are opportunities that you can't yet see and possibilities that you can't yet imagine that God is planning to unfold in your life. Maybe you're going, well, okay, that's great, but I'm not a prophet. I'm just a regular person with doubts and fears and struggles. Like forget all that miraculous stuff. Forget all that like miracle stuff. I'm just trying to learn to trust God and follow God in my everyday life. Like with like drop off and laundry and work and chores and friends and neighbors and family that's drama. And like to that, I would say me too, me too. But guess what? We're in this story too. So it continues. Second Kings chapter six, verse 15 it says, when the servant of the man of God, so Elisha's the prophet, he's got a servant. When the servant of Elisha got up early the next morning and he went outside, he, his first mistake was he probably went out before he had his morning coffee. He went outside and there were troops and horses and chariots everywhere. Oh, sir, what will we do now? The young man cried to Elisha. Have you ever had life fall apart when you weren't looking? Like you went to bed and everything was okay. 
But when you got up the next morning, the world was on fire, or at least your world was on fire. It's amazing how quickly life turns on a dime like that, isn't it? I, I, I remember the Tuesday afternoon, I was going to get a haircut in 2016, and I had just left. I had just sat down in sports clips in Yuba City, California, and my phone started blowing up. And I was getting a haircut. Leave me alone. I'm getting a haircut. When I got out of the haircut, my wife called my phone and she said, your dad's trying to call you. Take his call. And my dad called and began to explain to me that my stepmom had been attacked and ultimately murdered in a Macy's parking lot in Fairfield, California. Life can change on a dime. What do we do now? Have you ever had one of those moments? One of those what do we do now moments like the, the servant has in the story? I, I don't even know what to do. I don't know what my next move should be. We're, oh, it, it, it's, we're doomed. It's over. What do we do now? I don't know how to move forward. And so you're paralyzed and you're overwhelmed and you're scared and you're numb and you can't see a way through and you have no idea what to do. But you know what's worse than that moment? What's worse than that moment is when you have that experience and you open up to someone and they respond with some ridiculous cliche. Isn't that terrible when you're like telling them and they're just like, suck it up, you'll you'll make it through. Or, you know, like they give you some bumper sticker theology statement and you're just like, I'm going to punch you in the throat. Second Kings, in verse 16, it's he, the servant says to Elisha, what are we going to do? What do we do now? And Elisha says, don't be afraid. For there are more on our side than on theirs. To which I would be like, yeah, I know. God's on my side. I get it. That's easy for you to say. You're the prophet. You're the one that God talks to. You're the one that like, you can hear the other king's plans in your ear. And like, you're important. You matter to God. I know God's kind of on all of our side, but right now he hasn't come through for me. But it turns out Elisha actually can see something that the servant can't. So in verse 17, it says, Then Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes. Open his eyes and let him see. And the Lord opened the young man's eyes. And when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around them was filled with horses and chariots of fire. So just to make sure you're tracking with the story, Elisha prays for the sight of a man whose eyes work. He prays for his eyes to be opened so that he can see. See what? So that he can see his situation from a completely different perspective. Listen, the army of God didn't just appear in that moment. The servant just became aware of it in that moment. It had been there the whole time. There was a reality that Elisha could see that the servant had no idea existed. But once he saw it, he couldn't unsee it. And it changed how he saw everything. Don't you know he went from like, oh no, what do we do now? What's gonna happen? Don't you know he got a little cocky after that? Bring it on. Y'all want a piece of this? They may take our lives. Because you've had experience, you've had experiences in your life where nothing about your situation changed, but somehow the way that you saw it shifted. And when it did, the way you felt about it, the way you responded to it shifted as well. And what it is that you saw, you could never unsee. Suddenly there were realities that you had never thought possible. Suddenly there were options that you had never considered. I wonder how often we don't live the life that we ought to live because we don't see the world as we were made to see it. I wonder what your situation, what what situation you're looking at in your life, and it doesn't look good because you're not looking at it the way that God is looking at it. I wonder how your perceptions and your conclusions and your predictions and your imaginations about you or about your family or about your situation would change if you could truly see that God is present with you in the darkest moment. I wonder how you might live differently if you only saw differently. So then the question for us becomes, well, how does that happen? How how do we learn to see differently? How do you learn to see what you can't see? 
Well, here's how it happened in the story. Prayer. I mean, whatever else it is, prayer is the process of us inviting God to help us see the way that he sees so that we could see our life and our situation and ourselves and our family and our job and our neighbors and our enemies and our challenges and our problems and our opportunities and our country, that we could see all of it the way that he sees it. Because prayer is us acknowledging, God, I don't, I don't see everything clearly. I don't see everything accurately. I don't see everything fully. And I need you to show me what it is that I'm missing. I mean, I just have a confession. I spend so much time in my life describing my life and my problems to God, trying to get him to see them the way that I see them so that he will do the things I want him to do in my problems in my life. I mean, can you imagine how dumb is that? When what I really need, what would really actually change everything is if I flipped all of that on its head and began seeing my life and my problems and my situation and my world through the eyes of God. So there's a interesting verse, a couple of verses in Ephesians chapter one that talks about this. And part of what makes it interesting to me is that it is also a prayer. It was a prayer written by a guy named Paul as he sat down to write this letter to a group of Christians, a group of Jesus followers in a city called Ephesus. And this is what Paul prayed as he wrote, as he prayed for them and he prayed for you and me. In Ephesians chapter one, verse 18, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance, of his holy people, and his incomparably great power for those of us who believe. See, the truth is, we always see more than our eyes show us. We always have the capacity to see more than our eyes are willing to show us. And so he, as he's praying, as he's writing, as he's sitting down to pin these words, he's going, I, I want you to see what your eyes can't see. Because if you could see what your eyes can't see, it will change everything for you. I think if Paul were writing this today, I think he might have used like a, a camera to describe this idea in his prayer. And I know you know how a camera works, but humor me for a second. See, when you take a picture, the shutter on the front of the lens opens and it allows light to travel through the aperture and it burns the image of the negative. It burns the image that that, that, that lens is looking at. It burns the image on the negative of the film or the camera. The quality and the beauty and the clarity and the depth and the richness of the image depends on the amount of light that's let in. And the amount of light that's let in depends on how wide the aperture is and how long the shutter is open. And so Paul's going, I pray that the shutter on the lens of your heart opens wide and that God's love comes flooding in, burning his image and his reality and his truth onto the negative of your soul. And that the quality and the beauty and the clarity and the depth and the richness of that image the richness of what you can see when you do that will be determined by how wide and how long that lens is open. How often you put yourself in a position to open the negative of your life to the light of God, to shine in there and burn the truth of what's real onto your soul. It will change everything. And when you begin to see it, you can't unsee it. And notice the things that Paul prays that you and I would know, that we, that we could see, that if the, the shutter on the lens of our heart would open, that we would know these things, that we would know the hope to which he has called you, that, that you would live your life, that you would get up tomorrow and it doesn't matter what happens in November at the election and it doesn't matter what happens with the economy, that you would have a hope that couldn't be displaced because the lens of your heart is not open to a political light. It's open to the light that God shines in, that you would know the hope to which he's called you, that you would know the richness 
of the incredible inheritance that you have in him that's waiting, that he's just wanting to bring to bear in your life. And that you would understand his incomparably great power for you and towards you to work in your situation in ways that you cannot possibly imagine. His incomparably, there's no comparison. There's no way that we can even comprehend it. But Paul's going, you can't understand this, but I pray that your eyes would open so that you could see something that you can't currently see. The power of God to work in your situation and in your life and for your life. Can you imagine if we could see all of that? I mean, what would change in your life if you could see and know all of that? And so my question for you this morning is, what areas of sight What area of sight do you need to invite God to heal or repair or bring into focus? What or who do you maybe need to take a second look at? Where do you need to slow down and look closer and look deeper and look more intently with more curiosity and more God-centered grace in your life? What if this week, instead of looking to confirm what you already believe to be true, which by the way is the default we all look. It's called confirmation bias. That is the default in which we look at the world to find proof that we're already right. But what if instead of doing that this week, instead of looking for what you believe to already be true, what if you started looking for what you might be missing? Because when we take the time to actually see our perceptions are reshaped The narratives in our mind start to get rewritten. The conclusions that we've drawn get redrawn. And the possibilities that we thought would happen get reimagined. So I I, I wanna give you kind of a handful of assignments this week. I don't often do this. I usually just have one thing that I'm like, hey, let's try to do this one thing. But I, I want to give you a handful of assignments be, because I recognize every week when we get into these conversations, just like we're talking about today, there's more ways that you can see than we, can have, than we have time to talk about here. And so he, here's kind of the practical challenge. I want to give you a practical challenge that you would in your life this week that you would slow down, you would put your phone away, and you would look you would be aware. When you're in a moment, and I know it's crazy to do this, when you have to wait in a line, resist the urge. Don't pull it out. Leave it in your pocket and just watch, look, look at the person in front of you. Do you remember the days when people talked? Now we go, Don't talk to me. I'm looking at my phone. (laughs) But just look. What what conversations could be had? What could you see in your life that you're currently missing? Slow down. Put your phone away and look. Take Take the time to actually look deeply into the face of somebody close to you. Don't do that with somebody who's not close to you. You don't know. That would be really awkward. But look closely into the face of somebody that maybe you spend every day with and see them, see the real them, see their features, see the little wrinkles around their eyes, see the way their lips and their mouth move. One thing I noticed literally this year, I've known my wife since I was 12 years old. We've been married 29 years. I've known I, like everything about her. I noticed this year, she has the most active lips I've ever seen. She's so expressive. Like everything that's going through her head is being expressed by her lips because she cannot hide any emotion. And, and now she hates it. So I'm like, I'm like your, your lips are saying everything without saying anything. And she's like. <laughs> but, but take the time to actually look at somebody and see them or, or, or How about this? Maybe you should just shift seats in an old situation and and try to look at it from a different angle that you've never considered. Some problem at work, some issue in your family. And then begin to ask God to help you see and appreciate things in that situation or with that person or in your family or at your job that you never even noticed before. So that's all the practical stuff. And then on a spiritual level, Man, I, I, 
if there is some way I could convince you to have more of those moments where you open the shutter of your life, where you get quiet, where you spend time opening the scriptures, where you spend time connecting with God through prayer, and I know there's distractions and I know that it's like, God, is, is he listening? And is this real? I know all of that. But if you would take the time to open your heart to him, that his light would begin to shine into the darkest spaces of your soul, into the negative and begin to burn truth in your heart. And so here's the one practical way that I wanna invite you to do something spiritual this week. I wanna want want to challenge you to read the book of Ephesians with me this week. There are six chapters. You can read one chapter a day. We can start tomorrow. We're gonna read all those chapters together with the goal of opening the lens of your heart as wide and as long as you can to let his light in. To point your eyes towards what's true. Because what's gonna happen is when you begin to open the scriptures and you read Ephesians chapter one, and you're gonna see, you're gonna read more of the prayer that we read today. And you're gonna see how he talks about that power is not just toward us who believe, but that God wants to work it in your life. You're gonna, the second day on Tuesday, you're gonna flip and you're gonna read in Ephesians chapter two, verse 10, where it says that you are God's masterpiece that he created you, that, that he's had a plan from before he even, for your life, before he even created the, the world, before the foundation of the world, Paul says, that he has a plan, that he created you to do good. In chapter three, it starts getting like a little closer to home because there's stuff about forgiveness. And then chapters four and five, oh man, there's all kinds of stuff for parents and husbands and wives. And you're just like, all right, stop meddling in my life, Bible, Right? But can you imagine just opening our hearts and just going, let the light in. That's what I want to challenge you to do this, this, this week. Let's pray together. South Hills Church, I just want to take a moment and say thank you for watching our service online. Whether you're watching it for the first time or you're watching it again because you enjoyed the service so much from the weekend, I'd like to take a moment and dive into our giving. Every week we give people the opportunity to give back and give to the local church so that God can continue to bless your lives and bless your finances. Here at South Hills, we believe that everything comes from God. We believe that He's the one that chose us and brought us into this world, gave us our gifts and talents and abilities. And I just want you to know that when we give, we are giving back what God has already given to us. If you've ever seen any of our envelopes at a South Hills campus, you'll see on there that it says, every week at South Hills, your generosity is giving people the opportunity to live a better story. And there's a scripture on there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 that says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I want to encourage you today to click down below and set up your giving, whether it's for the first time or whether you're doing reoccurring giving. We have four ways to give here at South Hills. One, you can do it in person at any of our campuses through an envelope. Or two, you can actually text any amount that you would like to, to 84321. And the third way is to download our Church Center app. I encourage you to do this one because the Church Center app gives you opportunity to stay connected with our church and your campuses. It's a great tool and resource for you to know what's going on. And the fourth way to give is to give online. You can go to southhills.org slash give and you can set up your giving there. Whether you're a guest of our church or whether you are a member of our church, or whether you simply just like to watch our services, I encourage you to trust God with your finances so that He can bless and anoint your finances, and you can be trusting God in this journey of living life to the fullest. I love you, and thank you for watching our online service today.